Hello, everybody. Uh, my dear colleagues and friends, uh, my name is Figen Özçay. I'm going to present the data of the characteristics of Wilson's disease in Turkey between 1993 and 2025. This is the preliminary report of the Turkish Association for the Study of Liver Disease, Tosun Turk Metabolic and Pediatric Diseases Special Interest Group. <laughs> Uh, Wilson's disease is a hereditary disorder of copper metabolism that results in the accumulation of copper in the body, primarily in the liver, brain, and cornea. It is a rare disease with high economic burden. Since shelter drugs are important from, imported from abroad to Turkey, uh, the uh, clinical prevalence, genetic prevalence, incidence, and disease carry rate of Wilson's disease in Turkey is unknown. Could be high due to high consanguinity rate, which is 20 to 25 percent in Turkey. Uh, neonatal screening of the disease is not recommended due to the uncertainty and uh, there is Turkish uh, Wilson's disease pediatric guideline in the website of Turkish uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology Society. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, PubMed uh, data, uh, there are 137 articles related with Wilson's disease in Turkey, including large series up to nine form patients or single case reports. And we aim to create a registry for all the diverse clinical presentations, diagnostics, uh, parameters, and outcomes of Wilson's disease patients in Turkey diagnosed in all age groups. Uh, when we look at the methods, uh, an uh, electronic case report form for Wilson's disease was created by four experienced pediatric uh, and adult hepatologists, uh, Tussle Metabolic and Pediatric Diseases Special Interest Group. Executive Committee. We tried to access adult and pediatric hepatologists all around Turkey. Clinicians were informed and invited to join the study by TASL, uh, Google groups, email, and telephone conversations. And we established a WhatsApp group for uh, better communication. Uh, 43 centers were registered. Mainly pediatric hepatologists were interested. And passwords were sent to the uh, participants and uh, we included data of epidemiological, clinical, laboratory, genetics, and follow-up information. Uh, our results are uh, coming now. Uh, a total of uh, 1,091 patients were recorded uh, to the registry until January 2022. These patients were diagnosed between um, 1993 to 2024. Uh, the data of um, 224 patients were incomplete at the time of our analysis and returned to the uh, participants and uh, waiting for uh, uh, an, an, another correction. And uh, so we uh, have statistical data of 864 Wilson's disease patients. Uh, the Ferenczi score is uh, or equal uh, to uh, three. And uh, of the 864 patients, 824 patients were diagnosed before 18 years of age, while if only 40 patients were diagnosed uh, after 18 years of age, uh, but um, maybe uh, the, the, these um, re results, these numbers uh, can be changed after uh, the, um, the others, uh, the incomplete data uh, reanalyzed uh, right now. So here, here I will present data from 827 patients diagnosed in childhood. This is a large national Wilson's disease registry, uh, according to Ferenc score. And uh, the main age of the uh, patients were uh, eight, and uh, uh, there is male predominance among Wilson's disease patients. And there was no difference in terms of uh, mean diagnostic age between males and females. Uh, there is uh, a high parental consanguinity rate, up to 60%. Uh, this rate is very high than the other uh, series. And the, 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 when we look at the degree of parental consanguinity, there were first cousins mainly. The parents are first cousins mainly. And uh, in 45 percent of the cases, there was a family history of Wilson's disease, and uh, 80 percent of them, the siblings of the index cases. So siblings of the index cases must be screened for Wilson's disease, and the cousins they should also should screen for Wilson's disease. 
And uh, in uh, patients, uh, the, there are uh, 22 patients uh, diagnosed by family screening. Up to one uh, fourth of cases uh, were diagnosed by family screening, which is a good uh, result. And uh, the uh, patients diagnosed with family screening were younger than the patients without family screening, which uh, can uh, affect the um, prognosis. And uh, when we look at the hepatic involvement patterns, the main liver involvement pattern of the family screening was asymptomatic elevation of liver transaminases. Uh, and the second is uh, the patients with hepatosteatosis. They should be evaluated for Wilson's disease. Uh, hepatic involvement uh, is the main uh, clinical presentation at the diagnosis form. The neurologic involvement is um, um, less than hepatic involvement, which is uh, 13%, a uh, very uh, less amount of uh, psychiatric disease. Renal involvement may also, with nephrotiliasis, uh, renal failure and tubular disorders. Casaflagia sharing uh, were present in uh, one-fourth of cases. And when we look at the hepatic involvement type at the time of Wilson's disease uh, diagnosis, the asymptomatic elevation of transaminases were the main uh, is the main uh, uh, presentation type. So uh, uh, we can say that presentation with asymptomatic transaminase elevation is high than the other. Uh, registries indicating that high awareness of pediatric hepatologists for Wilson's disease in Turkey. And uh, clinical neurologic involvement is 13%, uh, with 10% of them together with hepatic and neurologic. And the main uh, disartery, toxic syndrome and dystonic syndrome are the main presentation of um, uh, neurologic involvement. We can see cataract also and Kaiser-Fleisch uh, The presence of Kaiser-Fleisch are uh, mainly uh, in uh, neurologic involvement group, uh, uh, very high than uh, hepatic involvement group. And when we look at the uh, metabolic uh, laboratory findings, some patients may have normal uh, ALT, AST levels and mean plasma level is 10. Uh, total serum copper is uh, in the low normal range and free serum copper uh, is uh, very uh, elevated, uh, uh, is elevated and 24 hour urine copper and hepatic copper concentrations are uh, high. Uh, we have to um, look, uh, we have to uh, is understand that seroplasmin may be normal in 10% of the pediatric Wilson's disease cases, and also 24 hours urine copper may be normal in 12% um, uh, uh, of pediatric Wilson's disease cases. Uh, this rate is uh, uh, lower than the other series. But uh, we can um, speculate that uh, maybe the, our uh, diet may contain high copper in Turkey. The, we can speculate that. And hepatic copper concentration uh, is mainly high in our series, uh, higher than to uh, 150. And when we look at liver biopsy findings, uh, liver biopsy uh, rate was 72% and mainly fibrosis 78 of uh, cases, chronic hepatitis and hepatosteatosis also is a, a very uh, valuable finding uh, in our series. Mutation analysis was performed uh, uh, in uh, the 41 percent of cases, which is good. And uh, there were two mutations in um, uh, uh, mutation screened cases. Is uh, sixty uh, seven, um, uh, seven of them had uh, two mutations, and twenty six of them had one mutation. Interestingly, some patients uh, do not have uh, mutation identified. Uh, when we look at the liver transplantation rate in our series, the liver transplantation rate in, uh, uh, in almost 10%, and uh, mainly uh, liver donors, but there are cadaveric donors also in, in uh, good uh, with good numbers. And the liver transplantation outcomes were uh, still surviving 
surviving uh, uh, up to 92% and exodus rate is low 7.6%. And um, liver transplantation was performed uh, actually in 81 uh, out of um, uh, 827 uh, patients who were diagnosed in childhood, which is not a very high rate good and available data uh, we can analyze only available data of 63 uh, patients and their mean transplantation age was almost uh, 13 years and uh, uh, all uh, all in all series uh, the um, 84% of transplanted cases uh, underwent liver transplantation during childhood and um, when we look at uh, uh, liver transplantation rates in diverse hepatic forms of Wilson's disease, uh, almost 45% of cases with acute liver failure presentation underwent liver transplantation, and 28% uh, of uh, cases uh, liver transplanted with cirrhosis presentation. And as uh, you see here, some uh, small numbers and uh, totally 17% uh, of cases with liver transplantation presenting with acute hepatitis and hep or hepatostatosis or even asymptomatic elevation of transaminases, we see they underwent liver transplantation. How can we explain this? Maybe this could be explained with non-compliance to the shelter treatment, maybe. In, and in our pediatric series, there were uh, three patients with isolated neurologic involvement uh, who underwent liver transplantation. And then we look at the treatment modalities. Uh, actually, uh, almost 75% uh, of uh, our cases had uh, the penicillamine and zinc combination uh, uh, treatment. And uh, zinc uh, uh, zinc. Uh, uh, sulfate treatment as monotherapy or combination treatment applied to 79% of cases. And the treatment compliance was very good, 80% uh, almost. And there are large series in the literature, like 182 children from France, and uh, giving their uh, results, uh, their clinical uh, manifestations and uh, presentation forms of uh, their children. Uh, some uh, points are different, some points are uh, the same in our series. So we conclude that uh, with Wilson's disease Turkish registry, there is high parental consanguinity rate in our registry and family screening enables us early diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Almost half of the patients had family history of Wilson's disease and uh, it's good one fourth of our patients were diagnosed by family screening. Uh, so Wilson's disease screening should include siblings and cousins of index cases uh, to early diagnosis to early, for early catch uh, of the patients. Uh, most of the patients presented with hepatic involvement. Half of the patients with hepatic involvement presented with asymptomatic elevation of transaminases. And as known before, cellular and urine copper could be normal in pediatric cases, but we have to uh, make further analysis uh, in uh, diverse hepatic involvement subgroups. And the last slide is uh, the most preferred treatment modality in Turkey was the penicillamine plus zinc combination. Actually, according to ASLD guidelines, switching to zinc alone is possible when the patient is on uh, is clinically well with normal liver function tests, est uh, estimated uh, non cellular plasmin bound copper and 24-hour uh, copper urine copper in desirable range. Uh, but uh, in Turkey, many patients, 90, almost 90 patients, continue initial chelation uh, therapy, chelation therapy, indefinitely in our registry. Uh, we have to bear in mind with high cost of shelters. Uh, uh, our in our series, the penicillin to treatment rate was low. Uh, 10% uh, uh, due to uh, side effects of the drugs. Uh, starting treatment with trianthin is not frequent in our country. Treatment compliance rate uh, was good. And 94% uh, percent of the cases were on medical treatment. Liver transplantation rate was 10%. And overall mortality, including liver transplantation, is low, 
in a total group three, only 3%. Uh, liver transplantation was successfully performed in most of the cases. And overall survival rate of children with Wilson's disease uh, who received medical therapy or liver transplantation is excellent in our study. I thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you for me to uh, give me the opportunity to present our data. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, good presentation, Dr. Özçay. Uh, now, uh, we, the last uh, panel has just came, Dr. Demir uh, also with us now. Uh, you can uh, discuss the oral presentation now. You can ask questions to the Dr. Özçay. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Özçay. Do you think we uh, use mutation analysis in all our patients or when do you use it? Uh, actually, uh, in the new uh, era, in the new age, um, and mutation analysis is necessary. Uh, but um, the, uh, the phenotype, phenotype relation is not... Um, is not goes one by one with the phenotype and genotype analysis. So uh, the, the most common reason uh, to understand how the, will the patient progress uh, uh, when we look at the mutation analysis, we try to uh, see the uh, pro, uh, future of the patient, but this is not um, possible from mutation analysis. So, uh, but in the, uh, the, the usual trend is now uh, performing mutation analysis instead of liver biopsy, liver copper analysis uh, is uh, more pre preferable uh, in these days. Can I have <clears throat> one more question? Um, in Turkey, we we are doing mostly living donor liver transplantation, and we have Wilson's disease, and uh, with relatives as donors. Yes. Uh, how is your approach to a donor uh, relative for Wilson's disease? Um, the donors uh, mean uh, the was mainly coming from parents in the pediatric age group, so they are obligate carriers mostly, uh, but um, uh, the uh, um, carriers can donate the livers to patients uh, have uh, becomes um, heterozygous, uh, yani, um, heterozygous and uh, can uh, survive uh, with um, their livers uh, as normal person, as a normal person. Mm -hmm. We can we, we may use the heterozygous uh, zygote livers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If you don't have any other questions or contributions, we, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, please, Dr. Kim. Hello. Can you open? Dr. Tapper, uh -huh. Dr. Tapper had his hand up before I oh. did. So, that's oh, okay. so I, I thought that was terrific and exciting. It was an inspiring multi-center effort. Uh, and so I loved that talk. Thank you very much. M what I thought was one, one part of the story that's missing is the difference in the outcomes for the proband, the patient that's presenting symptomatic, and the kind of screening efforts that you did for related people that were hinted at. And my sense is that one, the outcomes would be different, and that two, that's probably something to be proud of about how you improve the outcomes of people at risk for Wilson disease. 
Sure, um, yeah, you are right. The further analysis will come, uh, but in, in Turkey, some um, we have uh, problems with education and social problems. So even some uh, even patients diagnosed with uh, uh, hepatocytosis or uh, elevated liver transaminases uh, may uh, end up with liver transplantation. Uh, but we have to work on it. You are right. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question yes. is somewhat related. Um, um, obviously, we don't see as many Wilson's disease, and uh, we use ceroplasmin as a screening test. And you correctly emphasize that 10% of patients with Wilson don't have um, uh, low ceroplasmin. Um, yeah. I, I suspect that non alcoholic fatty liver disease is quite common. In Turkey, maybe not as much as in the U.S. So, if you see a, a, a child with abnormal ALT and uh, ceroplasmin is normal, how how far do you go to exclude Wilson's disease in that situation? Yeah, maybe um, urine copper uh, may help. Um, not seroplasmin is enough. Actually, in the series, the seroplasmin normal ra rate, uh, no, normal normal rate of seroplasmin in pediatric series is more than twenty percent. So, uh, it is a pitfall. Uh, so uh, maybe ultrasound or uh, close um, uh, follow up of the patient uh, may uh, help us. Yeah, it's a pitfall. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. If it is okay, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you. The, the second one is very popular issue. Okay, we can move on. Uh, Again, uh, the second uh, presentation is a very popular one. Um, the, the name of the presentation is uh, Liver Injury After SARS-CoV-2 Vaccination, Clinical and Laboratory Features, and Efficacy of Corticosteroid Treatment and Outcome. This presentation will be presented by Dr. Jumal Efe. Yes, please, Dr. Efe. Hello to everyone. Uh, 
Uh, I will present our work, which is entitled uh, Clinical Features and Outcome of Liver Injury After uh, SARS Infection Vaccination. This is international multi-center study. Uh, we all know currently uh, vaccination is the most effective tool against COVID-19. Uh, Pfizer, Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Moderna are the most commonly used vaccinations, vaccines. Uh, these vaccines uh, appear to be safe and well tolerated since only few serious adverse effects have been reported to date. Uh, SARS vaccines, vaccines trigger uh, the interferon pathway as a part of their mechanism of action, raising some concerns regarding possibility of vaccine-induced autoimmunity. To date, several organ-specific and systemic autoimmune diseases have been reported following vaccination. More recently, Brill et al. reported uh, the first case of liver injury following uh, Pfizer BioNTech vaccination. This case uh, showed uh, features of autoimmune hepatitis and successfully treated by corticosteroids. Uh, we collected um, data of cases that developed liver injury after vaccination from 19 centers. Uh, causal causality was assessed with the Rukia metho uh, method and uh, type of uh, liver injury with the R value. Severity was classified according to DILI uh, network uh, criteria. Uh, all uh, cause of, causes of uh, liver injury, such as uh, viral markers and metabolic uh, diseases, were uh, carefully excluded in these cases. And patients uh, con uh, considered as uh, an autoimmune phenotype if, if they had uh, positive autoantibodies and or elevated IgG levels. We collected uh, 87 cases, 63 were female, median age uh, was 48 years at the time of the diagnosis. 51 cases attributed to Pfizer-BioNTech was seen, 22 uh, Oxford AstraZeneca and 16 to Moderna. The median time from vaccination to diagnosis was 15 days, which is which shows a very uh, short latency period. Liver injury was predominantly hepatocellular and uh, showed uh, autoimmune phenotype. Corticosteroids uh, were corticosteroids were given to about half of patients. Uh, there was a positive trend with the severity of liver injury and uh, steroid use. All patients uh, all, or all cases uh, had good prognosis, but one patient developed uh, liver failure and underwent liver transplantation. Here you see general characteristic of patients uh, according to corticosteroid behavior. Uh, median uh, LAT, uh, SAT. Uh, total bilirubin, iosteroid treated patients than those uh, without. Autoimmune phenotype rates were similar in two groups and uh, severity of uh, uh, liver injury uh, as expected uh, was higher in corticosteroid treated uh, patients. Uh, days from peak LAT to normalization was uh, slightly higher or longer than corticosteroid treated patients. And uh, as you see, this group of patients uh, have a more severe features. Uh, that is the probably reason why this group showed slow resolution. According to uh, vaccine types, uh, all features, including uh, general laboratory or autoimmune phenotype or corticosteroid therapy rates were similar in uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, Oxford, AstraZeneca and Moderna group. Three cases experienced, uh, experienced uh, mild liver injury after first uh, vaccination, but uh, they presented with more severe liver injury when they received second same dose vaccine. 
including one of this group, uh, one of these three patients uh, uh, underwent liver transplantation. Two patients who developed liver injury following Oxford AstraZeneca vaccination were switched to Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for a second dose. Uh, both of these cases didn't have uh, liver injury. We could successfully withdraw on corticosteroid uh, in uh, 12 patients uh, after complete biochemical resolution obtained. Uh, none of uh, these patients had a relapse during follow-up. I would like to give you a detail details of one uh, case that uh, uh, presented uh, developed liver injury after uh, vaccination and uh, finally underwent liver transplantation because this is the first case in the literature. This case was a uh, 53 years old man, previously health, uh, healthy, received his uh, first dose of Bi uh, BioNTech vaccine on June, 5 June. Uh, this patient didn't have uh, any uh, history, history of disease or uh, therapy use and had uh, normal uh, LAT levels one year prior to vaccination. The patient presented with abdominal pains, severe uh, erythematous skin eruption and pyruritus 10 days after vaccination. These uh, symptoms uh, were initially considered as hypersensitivity, uh, hypersensitivity reactions and oral antihistaminic and topical steroid therapies were given. But this uh, therapy uh, didn't lead to clinical improvement. The patient uh, uh, was seen by dermatologist because he had uh, severe uh, skin eruptions and uh, prednisolone, uh, 32 milligram, was uh, started uh, uh, for a one uh, month therapy. At this time, patient um, had a laboratory workup and that show, shows uh, mild hepatitis. A week after prednisolone therapy, uh, his symptoms improved and uh, LAT and SAT levels decreased, slightly decreased. Uh, on July 20, he received second dose while he was also receiving uh, 16 milligram prednisolone. This patient uh, actually didn't want to receive second dose uh, because fear of uh, vaccine side effect, but he had a travel and due to flight safety issues, uh, full uh, vaccination uh, chart uh, was requested and then uh, he received his second uh, vaccine. Uh, following this, this second uh, dose, uh, similar symptoms uh, reoccurred, and he again went to dermatologist, and uh, prednisolone dose increased to 30 milligram day, gradually tapered, and this con uh, discontinued on the uh, mid August. Uh, one month later, he developed abdominal pain, fatigue, and jaundice. As you see, high uh, transaminase levels with uh, high total bilirubin. And the patient uh, was followed about 10 days in a local hospital, then referred, referred to tertiary liver transplant center. At the admission, uh, the aminotransferases were still high, uh, bilirubin rised, INR slightly pro prolonged. In the first evaluation, IgG levels was very high, uh, were very high. All other viral markers and extensive serologic uh, workup uh, were negative, and uh, other uh, causes of uh, acute hepatitis uh, were uh, correctly excluded. This is the liver biopsy. The patient underwent liver biopsy. Biopsy shows interface hepatitis with lobular inflammation and also lymphoplasmocytic uh, cell infiltration and here rosette formation and here amperiopolysis. These uh, four pictures show typical uh, histological features of autoimmune hepatitis. Then uh, prednisolone 40 milligram intravenosis started, was started 
Uh, additionally, plasma exchange uh, was performed, but this therapy uh, didn't improve to liver function. The patient developed the hepatic encephalopathy and underwent liver donor transplantation. He is now alive and with significantly improved laboratory findings. As a conclusion, this is the large international case series provides some evidence for the hepatotoxicity, probably idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity potential of SARS-CoV uh, vaccines. The clinical phenotype was mostly hepatocellular and showed features of autoimmune hepatitis. Corticosteroid therapy can be considered for patients specifically with features of severe liver injury. And overall prognosis was good, but one patient underwent liver transplantation. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Efe. Merhabalar. Yine bekleme odasınız. Şimdi yine sizleri alacağız Zeynep Hocam. Thank you for a good presentation, Dr. Efe. Now the presentation is open for discussion. And also contribution. Yes, Dr. Kim. It's a very, very interesting. Uh, the suspicion is there this patient did not have uh, underlying liver disease and it's a, uh, the, the case that had a liver transplant. It's a male and uh, pretty unlikely that this was an underlying autoimmune liver disease. But um, the question remains uh, causality. Uh, how do you define vaccine causing uh, this phenomenon? And you mentioned uh, uh, some metric that you used to, to uh, that's been applied for uh, DILI in general. Can you, can you talk about that and how uh, do you try to uh, correlate this vaccine use and the subsequent event? Yes, and indeed this is a difficult uh, question. It's uh, difficult to entirely uh, differentiate this uh, clinical condition. Uh, but uh, all patients uh, firstly had a normal LAT levels uh, about one year uh, prior to uh, vaccination. And also liver biopsy didn't show uh, advanced fibrosis, which is more uh, favored to, uh, to underlying uh, autoimmune hepatitis that uh, flared after vaccination. And these uh, findings may be a clue uh, for us, but uh, this patient has a very typical history because he had a first vaccine and developed uh, symptoms. And uh, incidentally, uh, corticosteroid therapy was given by the dermatologist that led uh, both uh, symptomatic and uh, clinical improvement. Uh, following sen second, uh, the same vaccine, and he presented with more severe uh, liver injury. I think uh, these uh, findings uh, show strong uh, causality between the vaccination and uh, liver injury. And I didn't uh, provide details. And the vast majority of biopsied patients uh, had uh, mild or no fibrosis. This is also suggests that uh, some, uh, some acute uh, insult uh, happened. And that may be, of course, a uh, flare of autoimmune hepatitis or uh, vaccine induced, induced liver injury. And probably this uh, event is uh, not permanent because we could successfully withdraw immune suppression in 12 patients. And you know, uh, real autoimmune hepatitis is immune suppressive dependent. And it's extremely difficult to, to withdraw, successfully withdraw uh, immune suppression in, in autoimmune hepatitis.
Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello again, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one question from the audience to Dr. Efe. The questions, uh, the questions from uh, Dr. Bülent Dertekin. Uh, he asked that, did the patients also have other autoimmune diseases such as Hashimoto, etc.? Uh, yes, uh, about 25% uh, of uh, patients uh, had underlying uh, autoimmune disease, mainly uh, has, uh, autoimmune thyroid, uh, thyroid diseases. And some patients uh, had uh, inflammatory bowel disease and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but they were not under uh, um, anti-TNF uh, therapy. Thank you. We can move on to the next presentation. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sang, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh no, this is a very commendable effort putting together this series. How does it change uh, your approach? So if somebody after the first dose of the vaccine develops um, elevation in liver enzymes or needs prednisone, does it change whether you do the second dose or this is anecdotal and you'll still continue with the usual series? Uh, I think our experience is anecdotal or only two patients uh, patients uh, changed their uh, second dose, but liver injury didn't uh, develop. Uh, probably it's the same in the DILI network, DILI approach, because you know uh, the same uh, exposure of the hepatotoxic uh, drug may lead uh, autoimmune like hepatitis or more severe uh, hepatitis. And I think for this patient, we, we can use uh, heterogeneous uh, vaccination. Uh, which recently showed that, show, uh, shown uh, more e effective than uh, homogeneous uh, vaccination. So uh, actually, um, our uh, results uh, may uh, may guide to the this approach uh, uh, for the uh, for the full immunization uh, for these uh, cases. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Okay, I think we can move on to the next presentation. Hello, I am Sabina Farzaliyeva. I am a resident at Hacettepe University Department of Internal Medicine. I would like to thank the organizing committee to give me the opportunity to present my research thesis in internal medicine, titled uh, Serum Branches Chain Amino Acid and Fructose in Nephil Spectrum. I have nothing to disclose. As we know, uh, nephrolytic is a liver disease characterized by abnormal, greater than 5% fat accumulation in the liver in uh, the absence of significant alcohol consumption. Uh, prevalence, uh, the prevalence of nephrolytic in developed countries is rapidly increasing. 
it's known that the majority of NAFLD patients are obese and metabolomic uh, syndrome criteria and frequently encountered in these patients. Uh, NAFLD is a general term and uh, NAFLD and its subgroups, NASH, are now the leading causes of liver disease worldwide. For example, hepatostatosis uh, is typically a non-progressive clinical condition, but NASH can progress to cirrhosis and even hepatocellular carcinoma. Pathogenesis of NAFLD. Um, today, the multiple hit hypothesis has been developed to better understand the pathogenesis, the pathogenesis of NAFLD, and this hypothesis is uh, currently the most widely accepted hypothesis. This hypothesis is, um, includes reasons such as increased insulin resistance, obesity, and um, metabolomic syndrome, triglyceride accumulation in the liver, and others that play an important role in pathogenesis of NAFLD. Fructose metabolism. Uh, dietary fructose consumption has been recently defined as an important factor in NASH pathogenesis. Fructose is uh, six carbon monosaccharides found in a wide variety of foods, and the fructose taken by diet is metabolized uh, to either glucose or triglyceride uh, by the enzyme fructokinase aldolase B. If daily fructose intake is too high, fructose is mainly metabolized to triglyceride, and these triglycerides accumulate in the liver, leading to NAFLD. This is the summary of fructose metabolism pathway causing insulin resistance and NASH pathogenesis. And uh, fructose causes not only steatosis, but also induced fibrosis and inflammation. Branch chain meta uh, amino acid metabolism. Uh, these amino acids uh, are essential amino acids, namely leucine, isoleucine, valine. And according to their degradation product, they are classified as glycogenic, ketogenic, or both ketogenic and glycogenic. Recently, a strong correlation has been shown between high plasma uh, branch chain amino acid levels and the risk of developing obesity, diabetes mellitus, or insulin resistance. Um, many studies have also revealed that plasma branch chain amino acid levels are increased uh, in NAFLD patients compared, with, uh, compared to healthy individuals. However, it's unclear if uh, this rise is re uh, related to increased muscle protein catabolism or obesity or insulin resistance or change in tissue metabolism. Given the link between NAFLD and metabolic disease like insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes mellitus, these amino acids uh, like fructose play an active role at the intersection of protein, glucose, and fat metabolism in half the people. The aim of this study uh, was to investigate serum, uh, fructose, and branch chain amino acid levels in healthy people and patients with NAFLD. We have included uh, 27 uh, controls and 105 uh, NAFLD patients. Uh, the patient, uh, patients were classified based on ELT levels and MR elastography findings. Uh, the distribution of NAFLD patients as subgroups were uh, 6 to 3 in steatohepatitis, uh, 29 early fibrosis, and 13 uh, advanced fibrosis. Fructose and branch chain amino acids were measured by using GCMS. And the median age in both control and uh, NAFLD group were uh, 49 years. The most of the patients were female, but uh, the percentage of male were 33% in controls and uh, 46 in NAFLD group. As expected, uh, the control group was a leaner with lower BMI, whereas ELT and triglyceride values were high in patients with NAFLD. NAFLD patients had higher serum fructose uh, levels of fructose. Similarly to fructose, serum leucine and isoleucine uh, levels were also higher in patients with NAFLD. However, uh, serum valine level uh, was similar in control and NAFLD groups. When we look at the serum uh, branch chain amino acid levels, uh, isoleucine and leucine are very positively correlated with, uh, with MRPDFF and ELT. The correlation analysis for serum fructose levels related, revealed that fructose wasn't 
associated with uh, associated with fat content of the liver. ELT was uh, a negative correlation with fructose, also this correlation wasn't statistically significant. Unlike branch chain amnesia, there was a strong positive correlation between fructose and um, fasting blood sugar. We analyzed, uh, analyzed the metabolomics data metrics obtained for NAFLD and control groups by using multivariate data analysis. Firstly, we searched uh, for any systemic errors uh, or outliers in the data sets. After removing the outliers, predominance of partial least squares discriminant analysis were performed uh, together and separately on the integrate omics data of each group. The feature shows the future shows multivariate data analysis of metabolite data identified by uh, GCMS analysis for control and uh, NAFLD subgroups. And um, this is the uh, VIP graph, uh, this graph of metabolites causing differentiation in data analysis. The metabolomic uh, data of control group didn't overlap with any subgroups of NAFLD and however, uh, subgroups of NAFLD couldn't be differentiated from each other. In summary, uh, NAFLD group has higher serum levels for fructose, isoleucin and leucin among branch chain amino acid, isoleucin and leucin positively and were positively correlated with MRPDFF, meaning that um, they might be microsteatosis, and possibly correlated with ELT, meaning that they might be microinflammation, and fructose. Fructose was strongly correlated with fasting blood glucose levels, meaning that it might be micro of insulin resistance. Metabolomic analysis could differentiate the controls from NAFLD patients, but uh, NAFLD subgroups had similar metabolomic results. <coughs> In conclusion, uh, elevated serum fructose levels is uh, associated with uh, higher fasting blood glucose, but not with parameters of NAFLD. Isolation and leucine increase in blood with development of cetosis uh, and inflammation in patients with NAFLD. And finally, we can say isolation and leucine might be potential biomarkers for NAFLD development. Thanks for TSL and ESL for giving me opportunity to present. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, now we can discuss the study. I think Dr. Yasemin Balaban is here for the answers uh, about the presentation. Doc, yes, please, Dr. Kim. It's very interesting. I am struck by the branch chain amino acid data um, because, as you know, the multi society nutrition guidelines advocate using BCAA in patients with cirrhosis to uh, prevent sarcopenia and improve nutritional status. So, this, if BCAA is really uh, positively correlated with uh, NAFLD. It may create a problem in patients with advanced uh, fatty liver disease for whom we really need to do everything that we can. Um, supplementing BCAA for their cirrhosis may be detrimental to those patients. Um, what do we do here? Um. Uh, I think the aim of this study was to develop a biomarker. As you know, the um, diagnosis of NAFLD or NASH is a, a, a significant problem in the clinics. Uh, so we were trying to find out a biomarker to screen the populations for these disease. Uh, but of course, uh, you made a very different contribution to our paper. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, yes, supplementations are not so much uh, innocent. Uh, and we know that uh, the people who are uh, using protein supplements for the sport purposes also have a uh, intensity, intensity to develop NARFLD. So uh, yes, you are, you, your concern is very important. Uh, we should be think about more how to make supplementation to cirrhotic patients. Thank you. Very interesting data. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any question or contribution, we can move on to the last presentation. Uh, you will be on uh, on live or pre-recorded, Dr. Adala. Presentation is... My presentation is live. Right, okay. We can move on to the next presentation. Hello everyone. I'd like to first of all to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me here today. My name is Gup Sadala and I will present you prediction of transplant free survival in primary biliary cholangitis by FIP4 score. I have nothing to disclose. Primary biliary cholangitis is a chronic and progressive autoimmune liver disease that progresses to biliary cirrhosis. Patients at greater risk of complications from PVC have inadequate biochemical response to therapy and advanced stage at pre presentation. Assessment of fibrosis stage grants prognostic value beyond biochemical treatment response at one year. Liver biopsy is not required for diagnosis of PVC unless PBC-specific antibody is absent, coexistent AIH or NASH suspected, or other comorbidities are present. Non-invasive tests can help better define individual risk of developing complications of advanced liver disease in the future. The aim was to assess the utility of baseline PIP4 score in predicting transplant-free survival in patients with PBC. We retrospectively reviewed a database of patients with an established diagnosis of PVC, having previously attended or under current follow-up at the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in our hospital between October 2011 and October 2021. Laboratory and clinical data were recorded at PVC diagnosis and end of follow-up. The presence of cirrhosis was identified according to the combination of clinical features and laboratory indices and or radiological parameters. FIP4 was calculated at baseline and was evaluated as a continuous and dichotomous variable according to established threshold that has been associated with advanced fibrosis cirrhosis. The threshold was above 3.25. Rocker was used to assess the accuracy of FIP4 to predict transplant-free survival. The influence of the biochemical and clinical variables on transplant-free survival was assessed with multivariable Cox proportional hazards regressions. To assess the prognostic impact of baseline FIP4 score, patients were stratified to FIP4 greater than 3.25 and FIP4 uh, less than 3.25 to estimate their survival with a kaplan meier curve. Baseline, here, here we can see uh, the baseline characteristics of the study cohort and 
The study consisted of 140 patients with a median age at diagnosis of 56 years, the median length of follow-up was 36 months, and during the study period, 12% of patients reached a clinical endpoint. 3% required liver transplantation, whereas a further 9% died without transplant. Patient's median FIP4 score was 1.56, and about a quarter, 24%, had a FIP4 score about 3.25. 26% of them were cirrhotic. Histological staging for PBC was assessed in 38 patients, and uh, only uh, 30 patients of them uh, had uh, stage 1 or 2, and only 8% had stage 3 or 5 disease. 20 patients had autoimmune hepatitis, PBC, overlap syndrome. The area under the curve for PIP4 score for the prediction of transplant free survival was 0 0.868. On univariate analysis, risk of death or transplantation was increased with higher PIP4 score at baseline, older age at diagnosis, higher baseline bilirubin, and lower baseline albumin. On multivariate analysis, older age and higher bilirubin and lower albumin at baseline were independent predictors of transplant-free survival. The transplant-free survival at 10 years of patients with baseline FIP4 scores below 3.25 was significantly improved to those with FIP4 scores above this threshold. It was 68% versus 96%. And the 10-year survival difference was 28%. The assessment of fibrosis stage at baseline by FIP4 predicts transplant-free survival. We demonstrate that age, bilirubin, and albumin at baseline are independent predictors of transplant-free survival. Determining fibrosis via transient elastography should also be considered in the risk stratification of patients with PBC. Limitations of this study were it was retrospective, contained a small number of patients, and was conducted at a single center. In conclusion, our findings show that FIT4 at baseline represented a simple, accurate, and non-invasive method for estimating transplant free survival in PBC patients. Further validation are needed to more precisely identify patients with advanced PBC disease stage. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Adela, for your good uh, presentation. Uh, is there anyone to ask something or any contribution? Uh, yes, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Adeli. Um As you know, there are like at least half dozen uh, markers of PBC prognosis, like Paris, Rotterdam, and you know, you name any European city, it seems like there's a marker uh, associated with uh, PBC. Have you made comparisons with uh, some of those markers or scores to see um, how they compare, how FIT4 compares with those? No, we don't know how to do it. Not yet. We will do it. Also, we will uh, the Oscar treatment response. Yes. Not yet, yes. The GLOBE score, I think, seems to be most yeah. often used. So for your paper, I think having those comparisons will enrich the value of the paper. But very, very helpful. Thank you.
Uh, but the, the main issue uh, in here is that uh, Dr. Uh, Gupse evaluated baseline prognostic factor, other uh, factors such as Paris, Barcelona, and UK PBC Globe. Uh, look one year uh, after uh, therapy, and they predict uh, one year after. Uh, so uh, their uh, findings are valuable and it's important to, to identify a risk group of a PBC at the baseline stage. And uh, so uh, I congratulate uh, for, uh, for this uh, nice presentation. As I know, uh, only few uh, uh, baseline um, uh, predictors have, have been identified for a PBC. I remember uh, APRI uh, was also uh, used and uh, showed good uh, performance and I don't know if uh, this, uh, their findings uh, should be uh, validated externally and uh, I found uh, very interesting your, uh, your study. Thank you. Yes, most of the studies are uh, <coughs> comparing APRI or V4 uh, with histological staging and not so many papers uh, to predict the uh, survival or long-term outcomes. Thank you. Good. Do you have contribution? Uh, I, I may ask a question. And uh, did you have any patients with uh, concomitant uh, fat deliver and uh, PBC? Because 5-4 uh, is most validated in the, uh, in the NASH uh, setting. And so did you have, have uh, concomitant uh, NASH uh, plus uh, PBC patients? Uh, no, I, no, I excluded the NAFOC patients. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but it would be interesting to include them. Yeah, I because at, at, least of patients. At, uh, at least 15 to 20 percent of patients uh, are uh, yeah. also have um, uh, nephilim. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So first of all, I thank to presenters for their studies and also I thank to all panelists that they're for their questions and contributions. Uh, goodbye everybody. Uh, have a healthy days. Uh, see you in other uh, meetings. Thank you.